title of Professor Kirby's talk is the United States and Greater China Universities as a Common Ground for Battlefield or Battleground. As we know, recently in Washington, the overarching view of bilateral educational changes is no longer one of hope for positive change resulting from academic engagement. Instead, politicians are concerned that Chinese scholars and students in American universities will only help China become a science and technology superpower at the expense of the United States. Professor Kirby, we really look forward to your expert insights on this critically important issue in the bilateral relationship. With my profound respect and gratitude, I would like to ask the audience to join me to give a warm welcome to Professor Kirby. Please, have a word. And uh, he will offer a 20 to 25 minutes uh, presentation and then have a dialogue with Professor Daniel Bill in the audience. Please, what's yours? Thank you so very, very much. Tonight, it is such a delight to, to be back at the uh, University of Hong Kong a place that I know very well for many decades, as it turns out, and also for a period of about 10 years being a member of the University Grants Committee, giving this university lots of money. Um, <laughs> and, 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 so uh, with, with the mission of, of helping Asia's global university uh, to succeed, and it has succeeded remarkably well. And the fact that it could recruit the, such talent uh, as Dr. Chung Lee here, Dr. Daniel Bell, uh, to its faculty now, just very recently, and to establish this new center gives me enormous confidence uh, in the future of HKU, and as it turns out, the future of our study of contemporary China uh, and the whole world. So uh, I'm just very sorry I can't be here on Friday to join in that, in that celebration. What I'm going to do is to talk something that builds out of this book that I published last year, uh, that uh, uh, Dr. Tony mentioned, uh, Empires of Ideas. How the modern university was created, the modern university, universities are very old, but the modern university was created in the 19th century in Germany, the first research university. The commitment to what the Germans called Mehrfreiheit, Bernfreiheit, academic freedom as we understand it today, institutional autonomy, uh, the unity of teaching and learning, all of those things that great universities like HKU take for granted, but are actually quite new historically. How the Americans built up a system uh, that was, uh, and still has some great strengths, although as you've been reading in the paper, we have some differences of opinion in American uh, universities uh, these days. Uh, and how, and whether or not Chinese universities, including those here in Hong Kong, which ranks so remarkably well in these global rankings, whether the universities of greater China will be the leading ones in the 21st century. And to find the answer to that book, you actually have to buy it, because I'm not going to talk about that theme so directly uh, today. But I will talk, as you can just see from this picture here, this picture of the Beidalo of Nanjing University, the great northern building of Nanjing University, uh, built not for today's Nanjing University, but for Jinling University, which was a Chinese-American joint venture operation, and a beautiful Chinese style uh, designed by an American architectural firm. An architectural firm that I recently discovered was a firm uh, of the great-great-grandfather of my colleague at Harvard, Dwight Perkins, uh, in the economics department. So the intersection between the lives of American and Chinese educational institutions uh, is really very, very strong. And I will argue as the prospect for being uh, enduring. Uh, when my university was founded in the late Ming Dynasty uh, in 1636, uh, of course, nobody at Harvard knew that. And this gentleman who was eventually John Harvard um, uh, had, would have had uh, no idea. 
Uh, this was a parochial uh, backwater, um, a comparative to, to China, to the Great Ming, not parochial Britain uh, at the time. Uh, but it would get interested in China and its connections with China not until more than two centuries later, when the man who made Harvard a great research university, President Charles Elliott, developed this gentleman, the Kumpa, to come from Ningbo to teach Chinese, the first person to teach Chinese at Harvard. Uh, and the Kumpa came, the recommendation of a Harvard alumnus who was in business in, in the Shanghai region, and uh, was very, very successful in our first curriculum. But it shows you some of the difficulties of international cooperation and success. He's, he was from Ningbo, which is, of course, a beautiful town, a salubrious, warm climate. And he moved to Cambridge, Massachusetts, which is not a salubrious, warm climate. And he died of pneumonia uh, about three years into his tenure. And we did not restart uh, Chinese uh, language for another 40 years. Uh, so not everything goes forward. Uh, Yale uh, was better at recruiting students uh, to the United States, uh, the first Chinese students and also teaching them about American culture. Uh, uh, pretty good baseball players, once upon a time. Uh, the first Chinese educational mission is the one to Harvard. But the long connections across the universities, you know, actually our first serious connection uh, with, with China was by our Arboretum, scientific terms. And if you go to Harvard and you visit the Arnold Arboretum, you will see extraordinary uh, examples of flora uh, that had been brought from China by a multi-year expedition by E.H. Wilson back to the United States, including the rediscovery of uh, a redwood tree, the dawn redwood, which was thought to be extinct, uh, but now can be found but in, back in California, where it was uh, native, uh, as well as on the Boston Common, uh, but originally found only some survival uh, pieces of it in the rural sexual. Another area of educational exchange, if you can think of it, uh, President Elliott, just after he had stepped down after 40 years of transforming Harvard University, uh, recommended the man on the left, the first president of the American Political Science Association, Frank Goodenough, to be the constitutional advisor for the new Republic of China. Uh, and Frank Goodenough helped to write two constitutions for the Zhonghua Mingguo, the first one uh, made uh, Yun Shikai president for life, and the second one would have made him emperor if he had not died first. And I always tell my students, this is Harvard's contribution to Chinese democracy. <laughs> we had a medical school in Shanghai. Rather surprising thing that, you know, and it, it did not succeed for, for very long, uh, but we tried, uh, and we act our Harvard Medical School today is very active. Uh, in China. Uh, and of course, we were active indirectly in what is today's Beijing University. Uh, today's Peking University is, of course, the campus of Yanjing University, uh, a Chinese American joint venture as well. Also, beautiful design uh, uh, by an American architectural firm uh, in Chinese style of uh, the core of the Beida campus. But naturally, it was Beida students who would have the first anti-American demonstration uh, of, uh, uh, here on May 4th, 1919, uh, 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 protesting against President Wilson and others in the Treaty of uh, Versailles, giving uh, Shandong, uh, or at least the German uh, sphere of influence in Shandong, back to Japan, or to Japan, rather than uh, giving it back uh, to China. Probably the strongest enduring connection between the United States and China in educational terms, however, is at Tsinghua University, founded in 1911, founded with returned funds from the Boxer Indemnity uh, for the purpose of educating young Chinese in the United States. Uh, and educated was formed as a prep school at Tsinghua Xuetang uh, to educate young Chinese in the United States. And it was at the suggestion of the president of the University of Illinois at Urbana-Champaign, the president Theodore Roosevelt remitted these funds. And that is why the first campus, uh, the original campus 
Okay, one looks like a lovely Midwestern American Kyrgyz, including an almost exact replica of the auditorium at Urbana Champagne, the beautiful auditorium, the grand auditorium of Tsinghua uh, University. And if you look at the connections between that university and the United States, extraordinarily strong across the first half of the 20th century. Here's just one example. The great historian, John King, who one of the greatest diplomatic historians ever to work on China, the history of China's diplomacy. He would go on to be a great diplomat, China's ambassador to the United Nations from 1946 to 1966, as well as before that ambassador to the Soviet Union. He was chair of the history department at Tsinghua University, got there on a boxer indemnity scholarship from Tsinghua, went to Oberlin College, got his uh, PhD at Columbia. But the connection that matters to me is that he was a teacher of my teacher. John Fairbeck, a Jung Chin Jiao Shou, here with uh, his wife, artist friend Wilma, and their friends, Liang Zichang and Lin Hui uh, in, in Beijing when Fairbank was learning Chinese uh, by flashcards uh, and learning his Chinese history. He became the, the, the founder of modern Chinese historical studies in the United States, but he learned his Chinese history at Tsinghua University from an American return boxer indemnity scholar at, who had been sent by Chuma. Or you can think of this gentleman here, Meiichi, also a boxer indemnity scholar uh, who uh, uh, studied at Worcester Polytechnic University in Massachusetts, came back to be president of Tsinghua University. And still to this day, my Tsinghua alumni is known as Tsinghua Dashua, the Yongyu Kishan the eternal president of Tsinghua University. He saw the university through the war and actually through the civil war, eventually went with Taiwan to found National Tsinghua University. And, um, and, but a man who protected what you might call the original goals of the modern research university, freedom of thought, freedom of inquiry, uh, of liberal education at the time of China's greatest national danger at a time when these characters epitomized the values of Tsinghua University. Uh, spirits on independent and minds on fetters. This uh, famous commemorative uh, statement is in favor and in, in memorial of a deceased Tsinghua scholar. Uh, but things don't always go right in Chinese-American relations. And by 1950 uh, here, uh, at uh, Tsinghua University and at almost every other Chinese university now under the control of the Chinese Communist Party. Uh, Anti-Americanism is in full display here after the American White Paper. Uh, I can't exactly what year that was. It's either 49 or 50 uh, about what American policy would be after uh, the end of the Chinese uh, Civil War. But this is not a favorable image of Uncle Sam as far as I can tell. Um, and academic relations are cut off for more than 20 years. John Fairbank once told me that his biggest regret as an academic regarding China was the cutting off of these academic relations uh, for maybe three decades, not a de facto, but two decades, uh, in terms of uh, any human or male or other contact with just many friends uh, in China. And in the United States, by contrast, as China becomes anti-American, the Americans become anti-China. This is Senator McCarthy uh, in uh, leading the red, the, uh, the uh, investigations of you know communist agents in the State Department and scholars who lost China, like John Fairbank. This is a later photo of Fairbank, but who was forced to testify to the House Un-American Activities Committee, as it was called as to why he, John Fairbanks, had lost China to the Congress, which is a lot of responsibility, uh, even for a full professor. Uh, or here, one of my predecessors uh, as dean of the Faculty of Arts and Sciences at Harvard, George Bundy, uh, during the Red Scare of the 1950s, he really sought to purge the student body of communists, or elected communists, people who were organized at Harvard in what was called the John Birch it's not John Birch Society. So the John Reed Society uh, for the young Harvard scholar uh, who uh, went uh, in the formative years of the Soviet Union, uh, extraordinary books, and 
Uh, Bundy summoned, this is a later picture of Robert Bella, the great sociologist, but when Bella was a graduate student, he was summoned into Bundy's office and told to divulge all the names of all the other members of the John Reed Society. And he refused, and therefore decamped to Canada. Uh, later on to be a great professor at the University of California uh, at Berkeley. So we have had battlegrounds as well as common grounds, my simple point here. Battlegrounds on the campus itself. This is students taking over University Hall, where I had my office as dean. Uh, and where Bundy had his office. The only time students, undergraduates at Harvard, ever get into, this is the faculty room at, at University Hall, that are, the only time they get into the room is when they take over the building. But here they took over the building, and many of them inspired by their own, first of all, it's an anti-Vietnam War demonstration, but a number of them, students for democratic society, they're inspired on what they believed was happening in China at that time. And thought that the American war in Vietnam was, in some sense, an aggressive war, again, to contain Chinese communism. So you know, who knows uh, how many of these were, would be Maoists specifically uh, among them. China is at the heart of the American debate on the Vietnam War during this period, a period in which I myself took part, I didn't take part in this, uh, but in various uh, demonstrations. And this is, of course, true and activity all over the country here at UC Berkeley, where the free speech movement becomes ever more radicalized in the 1960s and 70s, uh, uh, and at which point uh, Governor Reagan uh, dismisses the great president of the University of California system, Clark Kerr, for coddling the, the communists on the student body. Uh, this is uh, uh, in the early 1970s, uh, uh, getting, uh, again, China in, kind of in the background of these debates in the United States. And even today, if you look at the University of California, Berkeley, this is Senator, I mean, Congressman Gallagher, who, who doesn't chair the House Un American Activities Committee. It's now simply called the Committee on the Chinese Communist Party, if I'm not mistaken. I mean, at least uh, Chang Yu would even know the, the exact title of this, but something like that. And he is, you know, for some Period of time, he was obsessed about this this uh, weather balloon, um, uh, which was innocently simply trying to find out what the weather was like in North Dakota. But um, he is now uh, obsessed with a Berkeley Chinhua Shenzhen Institute uh, of Engineering, uh, which started before COVID, and he has summoned the people of Berkeley to come and testify before Congress, which I can guarantee you from the experience of recent university presidents has never a happy experience to come to testify for Congress uh, as to what Berkeley, why Berkeley is partnering with Shenzhen and Chihuahua. But I can tell you quite frankly, I've been to that institute, I went there right before COVID. Um, and it had just opened, and thanks to COVID, it has done absolutely nothing in three years. So he's going to have a very short investigation. Uh, these tensions have, of course, been, been a different example that relates to universities is here at Duke University. Here's James B. Duke uh, smoking, as always, a cigar. Uh, a man who brought the Americans and the Chinese together in their love of nicotine. Uh, because his company did more to addict both of our countries uh, to nicotine than anybody else. Uh, but he did donate the campus that would become the campus of the new Duke University. And it is that university that is now one of the most internationally minded of American universities, having established what like Yanjing University was in the 1920s, a liberal, a residential liberal arts college. 2,000 or so students. Uh, this one in Kunshan, not far from Shanghai, of course, and off to a, an extraordinary start in which there is common ground. Common ground enough that at this very moment they are building 20 new buildings with a third phase of Duke Kunshan University. We can go back to Tsinghua here. We know that the original campus in Tsinghua looks something like Urbana-Champagne, and the second campus looks a little bit more like Moscow State. <laughs> That's the model of the 1960s. Um, and this is a battleground too. I, mean, we, I don't have any pictures of anti-American demonstrations, although they surely existed uh, during 
the cultural revolution here, but mostly it was self-destruction uh, at Tsinghua University, and many people killed at Tsinghua University. Some level of education continuing. Um, so some people actually graduate, <laughs> and some people even then are at the center of things um, uh, at, at Tsinghua University. But if you're taking the more positive side, here a truly isolationist Tsinghua University at this moment in time, isolated from the Soviet mentors, isolated from uh, the, uh, the American or European or any other scene. Uh, so really, suddenly Gong uh, uh of, a, of a sort. But today's Tsinghua University is different. This is the dean, uh, in many ways, Zhu Rongji is the, uh, is the formal founding dean of the School of Economics and Management the Tsinghua University, which is the single most difficult school to get into in the world. Uh, but the man who engineered that operation is this gentleman, Chen Yi, a uh, Harvard-educated PhD from Beijing, of course, Harvard-educated PhD, uh, uh, who went on to be a full professor at UC Berkeley before being back by Zhu Rongji to be the dean of Tsinghua uh, School of Economics. And management. And today, as uh, Chang Li mentioned, uh, we have as one of the signal accomplishments of US China academic, academic cooperation the establishment of the Sushman Shugan Schwartzman College, where Professor Bell has taught brilliantly. Uh, another beautiful facility in a certain type of Chinese style by another New York architectural firm, <laughs> um, um, and, uh, and one that has as its promise to bring the best and the brightest of the world to Chihuahua. Chihuahua, a place that was designed to send people away to the United States, now bringing the best and the brightest, and many of my Harvard students very happily up behind for positions, uh, for places at Chihuahua University, extremely difficult to get. Uh, and off to an extraordinary start. And here we have so many areas then of a sense of a moment in which we are in now, and we hope it will have not passed, of real engagement. So this China Committee uh, of Mr. Gallagher wants to investigate the Nanjing University Optin Center, which is nearly 40 years old, and it's been a singular success in educating young Chinese and young Americans in each other's languages, cultures, and politics. Uh, very, very successfully. That's the kind of first one. Uh, many universities now have centers. Stanford has a Silicon Valley on the, on the Bay Documents, an absolutely beautiful center. Uh, the China Europe Business School, uh, a beautiful facility designed by I.M. Pei. A University of Chicago has a wonderful center outside of uh, the, the, just outside the gate of Renda, of uh, People's University. Um, and while Shanghai has its gorgeous new campus on what is euphemistically called the South Bund, and I don't know if you've been to Shanghai, but there's a new part of the Bund that is so far south that you have nothing to do with the Bund. Anyway, it's a nice, it's good marketing. Um, uh, and at our Harvard Center, Shanghai, uh, most of you know, we don't sadly have the whole building. <laughs> we do have a floor, uh, and it's been a center for our activities and teaching. My former colleague, at the, who is now at Nanfang Kajin Ashtra, at Jin Li, uh, teaching uh, at Harvard Business School is uh, at, at our facility there. And uh, we, we are active and continuing to be active, uh, you know, determined that despite the political head both from the Chinese side and the American side, but particularly in recent times from the American side, we will continue. You know, we're better known in China actually for this car, uh, the Hanbo, uh, which is uh, one of our one of the many uh, copyright infringements uh, that we have. What's actually bizarre about this car, which is uh, done by uh, Chongqing Motors, uh, is that it is now being you know with the Ukraine war and the Soviet car industry having a collapse is now being exported in large numbers to Russia. So all these Harvard cars going to London, it kind of freaks me out. So let me get back to the theme here um, of, this, of this enterprise. 
So my university, but it's by no means alone, my university has been deeply engaged with China from a good part of, it, of the 20th century, but particularly uh, since the 1990s, President Rubenstein is the first uh, U.S. Uh, Harvard president to visit uh, to visit China here with President Jiang Zemin. Uh, president Jiang Zemin then gave a major speech at Harvard. Uh, president Wang Jiabao came to Harvard, and this is when I was dean of the Faculty of Arts and Sciences, and I was his host, in fact, his de facto host for almost the entire occasion. And it shows you that even the most seemingly intractable problems in U.S.-China relations can be solved. He wanted to speak in the same hall where President John had spoken, which is, uh, which is in our memorial hall at Sanders Theater, which is the largest single venue for an undergraduate, for a lecture or concert that we have at Harvard. Uh, but he wanted to speak at a time when my colleague Michael Sandel, <coughs> political philosopher, political scientist, was teaching his course on justice. So I called up as dean, I called up Professor Sandel and said, Michael, would you mind moving your class to the premier of China? And he said, yes, I would mind. I'm not going to do it. Um, uh, and I, because it, it was his very last class of the term. Uh, and there was no other place big enough to do it. But he invited Premier Wang Jiabao to come and speak about justice in his house. Wow. And the Premier said, no, thank you. <laughs> I don't do that. Uh, so then we turned to the second biggest venue we have on campus, which is Memorial Church. Uh, but the last person uh, that we had hosted, and actually I had been the host at Memorial Church, was the Dalai Lama. Uh, so this was uh, not not proper enough. So he ended up speaking at the Harvard Business School, which is just right for a leader of contemporary uh, China. And he did a spectacular job. Our former president, Ru Faust, uh, visited President Xi when she was president. Uh, and as you may or may not know, uh, President Xi is a Harvard parent. And <laughs> President Xi thanked Harvard for her his daughter's education. And he said, when she came back, her thought had changed. <laughs> we have no clue what that, what that meant. Uh, uh, President Bacow, right before COVID, uh, President Mary Bacow went and had really an extraordinary meeting uh, with President Xi. I was there, my colleague Mark Elliott, others uh, were there at the, at the time, uh, about how universities could cooperate when governments cannot. And President Xi used this meeting, in my view, as a, as a means of telling his own government that it was okay to continue to send students to the United States. Um, and there was kind of a, an instrumental use of this operation. And uh, it was, a, I had the good fortune of riding shotgun uh, on this one and uh, escorting Harvard's president there. Um, and most recently, uh, had the opportunity to reunite with a, an old friend, uh, uh, now Party Secretary Chen Jining of Shanghai, with whom I worked to establish the Schwarzman program where he was the president of Tsinghua University, and a man who also assures us, as he assures uh, the universities in Shanghai, that he will do anything that he can to restart, which is our task, really these days to restart relations that had gone, if not stone cold, pretty, pretty chilly over the last several years. Not everything is that easy, however. Uh, I teach also at Harvard Business School, and I'm, I'm now writing my second HBS case on uh, Huawei. And when I went to met, meet this gentleman, I read John Fay in 2019, I got a call from somebody at the business school said, you can't do a case on Huawei. <laughs> you heard that Huawei, and of course, I had heard that there was some concern uh, about about Huawei. But this is what having tenure is all about. <laughs> and, uh, I, I called up the head of research for the university, and I did not ask permission. And, you know, it's always better to ask forgiveness than permission. <laughs> I did not ask permission, but I told him what I was going to do. Uh, and I went ahead and did it, and we had a spectacular set of meetings uh, and uh, a really interesting case, which I strongly recommend to you, 
uh, about what, how Huawei came to founder in the United States, and they didn't interfere with the peace. We're in a complicated time for right now because you have different strands in both countries. The universities and the leaders of universities truly want to cooperate. Elements of both governments truly don't want to cooperate. Here, the growth of that political thought uh, and ideological training in Chinese universities, um, different approaches to ideological training in Chinese universities, but a certain sense that somehow or other the foreign is bad and the Chinese is automatically good. Uh, this is the kind of training that we have yet to adopt at Harvard, uh, <laughs> Chinese universities, but it doesn't augur well for the future of our cooperation. Uh, and yet, at the same time, I know from having taught at great Chinese universities and having lectured at great ones such as this, uh, that you know, there is this approach uh, that and this is one way to mobilize young students. But there are other ways to mobilize young students too. These are young students who follow the exhortation of Xi Jinping to study Marx. And they actually read Marx, not just the Swahwe to Marx, as you read in, 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 the, in the textbook. They read Marx and they went out to start neighbor unions and sweatshops in South China. Turns out that's not what Marxism is supposed to be, uh, according to the Chinese Communist Party. But this is another side of students that is very similar to what you might find in the United States. Okay, our campus is today full of protests on different matters. And even if one can't protest directly, one can protest indirectly uh, at Chinese universities. And so the idea that there is still a tradition of Lan Freiheit and Lehr Freiheit seems to me to be extraordinarily strong on both sides of the Pacific, even if people cannot act on them at any moment in time. Here, of course, we shall have to wait and see what the long-term implications are for great institutions, the great, great public institutions here in Hong Kong, of this new law. Um, I'm going to find some real wood in Hong Kong. <laughs> that the traditions that have made these universities great continue, but one has to has to fight for it, this level of, 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 uh, of openness that has been that has been uh, You have some going the different way, some three universities deciding that they will quit global bank rankings in China to pursue a job, a education with Chinese characteristics. But quite frankly, all of these three are for quite a different reasons have been under huge political pressure uh, to do this. They don't do this willingly. Uh, and the fact of the matter is that Chinese universities have grown up in the company of American, European, and other global universities. That's the company that they, they, that, uh, they were founded in. That's the company they want to keep. And that's the company that they have the capacity to meet if given the chance. And that's why I take, you know, uh, heart and uh, just nearly at the end here in this document signed in 2013, the same year that the party said that there were seven things not to talk about at universities, university presidents signed with American and British and Australian and other university presidents, the principles of what the characteristics are of the modern, of the contemporary research university. And these characteristics are ones that back in Berlin, if he were to be resurrected, Wilhelm von Humboldt would recognize. The idea of academic freedom at the top, a tolerance of competing views and perspectives, the right to set one's own priorities, and so on. This is what Chinese university leaders will need, even if they cannot always act on these beliefs. Finally, let me just end here with an event that happened at my university's 300th anniversary in the year 1936. Um, 300 years after founded by John Harvard. That's University Hall in the background, my office indeed in the background there at that scene. Um, it's through this gate uh, that the representative of Peking University came sure, to receive an honorary degree on our 300th anniversary. Uh, and he dedicated this steely outside of Widener Library 
inscribed in his own calligraphy with a message as to why, for both sides of the Pacific, for the United States and for China, why there is so much more common ground uh, than there is a battleground. Why, do, why are universities important? They said this, culture is the high point of a nation, and it's by virtue of its culture that a nation arises, but truly it is through the learning to share uh, that culture flourishes. Intellectuals with deep knowledge and far-sighted vision understand that it is establishing a solid foundation for their nation, and in our case, for both nations. The utmost priority must be given uh, to the enhancement of learning. Uh, it reads better in Chinese than in English, but I can't, uh, I, in either language, I can't improve on Lucia, so I will stop here. Thank you very much. Thank you, Bill, for the uh, lovely talk. And I must highly recommend this outstanding book. Um, I, I read it very closely. Usually when I read books, I, I take notes and I say, I want to see which parts I disagree with, but I found very little to disagree with. It was more learning. And it's really outstanding because um, there's different chapters on each university with, his, with lots of history and, and sometimes humor as well and personal stories. It's really accessible uh, to, to, uh, to non-experts. Highly, highly recommended. Um, so before, why don't I just ask one question? And it comes more from my area as, as a political theorist concerned with normative issues. I mean, this is a little bit unfair. And I'm not going to ask you like US politics answer yes or no. You still answer the fine. And um, so there, there, it seems like there might be two possibilities. One is international standards for research universities with academic freedom, tolerance, and academics should be able to do what they want. That's fine. We, we all agree with that. But the other alternative seems to be just propaganda for the government. But are there other alternatives? For example, are there possibilities from Chinese history that are that may offer inspiration for thinking about how Chinese universities should be run today? that differ from international standards and that are not pure propaganda? And if, and if so, what might they be? You are better positioned. I have, I have my, you are better positioned to answer that. I mean, so I cannot, of course, there are great traditions of, of remonstrance if you're talking about politics, uh, of creativity. I mean, um, you know, if you look at the work of uh, Chinese academies uh, uh, that, you know, Sometimes you know, would often be leading edges of intellectual change uh, uh, decades ahead of, uh, of them being into, into the intellectual mainstream. You do have that long, you, you, you do have that long history. You don't have a history, and there's no reason why you want to, because it's new every year. You don't have a history of actually assuming that the job of a university is the creation of knowledge, but rather the repackaging, or that's too, too negative of but the reimagining of knowledge. Uh, you don't have, to my knowledge, uh, that tradition in, in academies, in scholarly uh, organizations uh, uh, in China, but it is new everywhere in the 19th century. It's not, it's not as if this is not, a, the idea of this modern research university is pretty close to De Novo. Uh, the only thing before Berlin that comes close to it is uh, the Napoleonic Academy. Uh, that are comparatively, comparatively doing so. It is. Uh, uh, I would, I would say that aside in, in, in implication of your question, if I understood it correctly. So then, and I, and then I do want you to answer your question. <laughs> is that you know? Can you have a great university with an imperfect level of academic freedom? The answer is absolutely yes. Mm -hmm. If you look at the German examples of the 19th century, Germans led the world, but as Max Weber said in a, a speech around 1909, uh, yes, we have academic freedom outside, you know, but you know, outside of the political and ecclesiastic realm, really not. Uh, that is to say, we are 
you know, we don't have it. We, we are constrained in those two areas, and that constrains an enormous number. Like you have, you know, the University of Berlin becomes the greatest university in the world for 100 years. Uh, but it doesn't become it by being open to talent from all the, you know, uh, diversity uh, uh, movement in the University of Berlin. They're all, you know, uh, loyal servants uh, of, the, of the state. Uh, they're at a time when the German Social Democratic Party is the largest political party in Germany. By 1913, there's not a single Social Democrat on the faculty of the University of Berlin. So you can have liberal education in an illiberal polity. Uh, in that regard, uh, there are gradations, and no university, part of what I was trying to show here is that no university has been perfect uh, in its protection of what we think today is optimal academic freedom, and still not, uh, still not there. But what would, what would be some examples from the Chinese experience that you would, you would I think, be able to not have played? Well, I mean, as you know, I fought at Tsinghua for many years, and one of the things about Tsinghua is it's very, there's a very strong sense of social and political responsibility, and the idea that the yes. university is detached from the rest of the community and that academics mm -hmm. should pursue their research regardless of the impact on society, that's a little bit foreign. So there, there is no, a view. That's absolutely right. Yeah. And actually, it's in the slogan of Tsinghua. Right. You know, it's a jungle sheet. Right. Right. So, uh, it's, uh, and so it's, that the sense of a university exists to serve the country. I would say, however, that is stronger. This, this uh, you know, common newspaper term of ivory tower right. does not apply to most American universities. You know, Harvard was founded as a public university. People paid taxes even in Connecticut to support Harvard until this, you know, unfortunate thing called Yale. Was founded some years, some years later. So, um, and uh, Harvard is a private university that has always had a strong sense of public purpose. And every, you know, most universities in the United States are public universities, and they have a duty to the public of their state and to the country. Uh, it is in their in their DNA, really. So, the idea of them being, you know, separate areas. Unconnected to society. It's never been true, and it's absolutely not true today if you look at the rhetoric uh, that uh, motivates people uh, and gets people on the streets at, at, at many youth and American universities uh, today. But I think you are also right that the purpose of education is more strongly in a Chinese tradition, as in the old imperial examinations, the purpose of education is to serve the state and indirectly your family, presumably, and others, but to serve the state. And that has been very strong in the institutions that grew up in the first part of the 20th century. And it's been as strong in the Nanjing University, private Chinese American venture, or Jinling University, uh, as a Chinese University, or it paid out. Right. Thank you. Ideally, it would be not just serve the state, but serve Tianxia, the world as a whole. <laughs> Thank you. So, another question, maybe. Another kind of potential downside of this of this international model is that is that it leads often, I mean, I'm, I'm involved, to hyper specialization where professors get research rewarded based on original work in a in a tiny field, and it's hard to do good interdisciplinary work. So in, in China, as you know, there's this revival now of interdisciplinary studies in the form of the Guo Xue Yuan. These kind of right. these, these institutes, I mean, uh, that focus on traditions from Chinese culture and that look at them from interdisciplinary perspectives. Do you think that there's anything to that? Well, I think it's a very good thing to do. And one of the great problems of the this obsession with rankings mm -hmm. is that they rank only what are kind of rankable across countries. They tend to rank almost exclusively in the STEM fields uh, or largely in the STEM fields. So whether it's in France or in China, uh, uh, they don't look at you know your knowledge of French literature uh, or your originality in re-examining Chinese culture or anything or anything. So, so looking at Guoxia in an open way, and not Guoxia in a way that is kind of kind of you know is set in stone by textbooks, but to allow people to actually examine the extraordinary rich culture uh, of the, uh, the rich inheritance of China. That makes enormous sense, it seems to me. And that's something that you know, 
So you have, you know, you, you have some great examples. The Peking University has this UN pay program in which people study the Chinese classes, young people study, and the Western classes in the original classical Chinese and in some cases in the original Greek. Uh, that's something that's far beyond the capacities of any American student I know. Um, uh, I, I, I think that there's, there's an, as long as, as, as long as you don't assume that there is one voice, but multiple traditions to look at to, in order to help the people understand. But I think it's a great tragedy in the, you know, in, in, for that university presidents, they have to do this, they have to pay attention to these stupid rankings. And, you know, these rankings matter for HKU because you have to be above CUHK. <laughs> and, and all of that, but there was a moment I remember actually when Victor Fung was uh, was chairman of the council here, where the Hong Kong University was ranked number seventeen in the world, and Stanford was number eighteen uh, oh. in the world. And you know that moment may it come again, uh, but it's fate. We should not obsess about that. You'll be able to try to mainly Chinese. And Hong Kong universities together are among the most powerful block of universities in all of these rankings. But if that comes at the cost of not knowing your own culture uh, and of studying simply those things that get you ahead, these things, it's, it's, it's very sad. That's why, you know, Renmin University is one of those withdrawing from the bold rankings. They're under, they were under huge political pressure because of these Marxist study groups and so on. But also, that's not a university that's strong in the sciences. They're very strong in the social science. They're very strong in Chinese history, particularly in the imperial history. And, you know, God bless them. Okay, thank you. Another potential downside of the international standards and the rankings in particular is that teaching is often devalued. So in China, as you know, you have these model, these kind of are called normal universities, Shifa and Dashi which emphasize teaching. I mean, it's not only about teaching, but more than traditional research universities emphasize teaching. I mean, is that a kind of model that's worth pursuing? I think it's a totem. I think that this is another tragedy of the kind of homogenization of thinking of what makes for a great university. These, these, these rankings measure teaching only to the degree that they look at the student-teacher ratio, so which tells you almost nothing about it. Uh, you have, I think, in my view, in Chinese universities, too many too large lecture classes that people take in their undergraduate careers. And usually there's seven or eight courses a semester and it makes it very difficult to get you know, the past the courses but it needs to be enough. Uh, I remember asking the president uh, of a major Chinese university was were there teaching evaluations for their courses? And he said, of course there are. It's the party secretary. And, and I said, well, who gets to see them? He said, I do, <laughs> but nobody else. Uh, but if the students don't get, you know, so when I finish teaching a course, uh, we have these, these uh, ratings by the students uh, that are then published. So that the students the next year can know to avoid that course because this guy's a terrible, uh, or that he's good or, or, or whatever. But, there, but it is a problem everywhere for research universities. Despite all the rhetoric of American universities valuing teaching as much as they do research, and so on, at the end of the day, almost all of the professional awards are in research. When I was dean, I did establish a series of new teaching awards uh, with a fair amount of money attached to them. It turns out that great teachers like money, like everybody else. <laughs> but whether that actually incentivizes people to be great teachers, I seriously. Okay, thank you. Um, maybe one question about Schwarzman College. Actually, this morning, I just did an online course in the same course oh. that you were part of. And as you know, thank you, by the way, for being the uh, chair of the Academic Council at Schwarzman College. And uh, as you know, there's only one course now at Schwarzman College that deals with humanities. And um, so, okay, so the, the question, though, is that in the first year, as you remember in, at Schwarzman College, we had great students from the West Point Military Academy, yes. the Naval Academy. By the way, one student from West Point Academy, she she liked the, the training of the, of, and she says, we should do that in the U.S., you know, okay. and she actually wrote an essay on it. It's sort cool. of a lot of mutual learning. But well, we do have our OTC. Right. I don't know. Okay. But it's compulsory for all students, as you know. I am. So, so. 
but the U.S. government, I believe, does yeah. not allow uh, students from military backgrounds anymore to come to Shorts New College, right? We, and we are working on changing. Oh, really? But, uh, but you know, again, this is an incredibly short-sighted right. operation right. from my point of view, right. because they were outstanding students. Right. You know, the people getting into an American military academy is actually almost as difficult as getting into cheap. Not quite. But it's uh, and so they they there were remarkable attempts. And I remember meeting a number of them at the Fort the College in Beijing, and they they had a different dimension. To this. I know that actually President Chung, President uh, Chen Jining, and uh, Steve Schwartzman had the idea that this would be part of the mix. Right. They said not necessarily just from the United States, and so that the Americans, you know what. You know, this gets you into the mutual paranoia of both sides, which is part of the battleground self side. That is to say, and Chinese hearing to some degree Western ideas and certain forces, uh, these seven things not to talk about. And the Americans, I don't know what they imagined that these, I mean, if these young cadets will become, you know, Wong Chang Dao. It seems highly unlikely. Mm -hmm. But, but, but it's, it's, we are trying to get that reversed. So are you hopeful about Schwarzman College more generally? I am. And I, you know, I'm hopeful about universities also more generally. This is a really tough time for our, particularly for our colleagues in mainland universities over the last three years of zero COVID, but over greater, ever greater political goals, despite the wishes of their presidents and party secretaries who signed that document that I showed in 2013. And yet, you know, in my conversation with them, I have a sense they've, some of them have seen this movie before. They need to outlast set of campaigns. But one thing is universities outlast governments. Universities outlast political parties. I didn't mention that to President Xi. Uh, <laughs> but they do. Uh, and that's why we, uh, in our connections with with uh, particularly with mainland Chinese, that's why we have to take a really long view. It's not about, and yes, of course, we want to re-engage, uh, have more of our students come here, more of their students come in. The number of Chinese students coming to the United States has been up this year. Uh, and we'll, I think, get back to where it was before COVID. So that's a, that's a good sign. Uh, but we have to look 10, 20, 30, 50 years ahead uh, about how great systems of higher education work together to solve global issues. So, how concretely could, what does that mean in practice? How concretely? <laughs> yeah, um, I think by institutions such as this, research centers that bring people together uh, on neutral ground, if not common ground, uh, uh, the capacity to have frank discussions, the capacity to find important. Research. There was an extraordinary amount of, of Chinese American cooperation uh, in epidemiological research before COVID, all of which fell victim to political disputes. Uh, but that's actually, you know, you know, COVID is not the only thing to hit the human race. It's very important that the, the, the great Chinese and international scientists work together on, on these issues and not be bottled up in their own small laboratories. Um, and so I, you know, I know, you know, what can one say? The, the biggest restrictions in recent years have come from the very top of both governments and not from below part of the leaders of the universities. Okay, thank you. One last question before we open it, um, and you don't have to answer it. Um, this book, one thing I liked about it that is quite optimistic uh, about the future of universities, but arguably the least optimistic chapter is the one on Hong Kong U. And, <laughs> and since you've written the book, you've made four visits, I learned, um, in post-COVID times to Hong Kong. Have your views about Hong Kong U changed at all? Since you wrote it's a great question. Great question. Um, well, the good news is that the trajectory that I saw uh, in this book, and now you're all going to buy it, has not gotten worse. And in many ways, I think it's statewide. Um, there was quite rampant political interference uh, in the workings of the university. Um, I was tasked 
with uh, uh, two other members to, uh, to be a governance review committee in 2016 for HKU because the, 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 the faculty and to some degree the students, the guard, out of the student, and the government would truly have an audience. And we came up with a set of recommendations uh, that were un unhappy in my point of view. You know, I mean, it's actually a pretty dramatic story of confrontation with the then chief executive, uh, uh, Mary, uh, because as I was told directly, Beijing won't stand for it. Um, now, you have to read, see if you agree with, with me, but the, uh, uh, many of the reforms actually were in hand, were, we did, were, were put into place, but the most important one, of, which was the recommendation to have the chief executive depute his or her powers as chancellor to the vice chancellor of the university. You know, you may or may not know, but in British style systems, chancellors are in modern times supposed to be honorific. They are supposed to not to interfere in the day-to-day -day, uh, workings of the university. But I was told by the then chief executive, and I will quote from the book, well, you know, I don't need to be chancellor in order to interfere with the university. <laughs> um, uh, and, uh, which is true. But that's not good enough for a university uh, such as this. Things actually got worse then before they got better under his successor. But I think things now, you know, I think uh, President Zhang Chung has done his absolute best to, to, uh, to defend the university. The thing to worry about in the long run, you, you will know this from looking at the newspapers. What is the biggest risk of any great institution going forward? It has to do with governance. How, how are the fundamental decisions made in governance? And Hong Kong has had, Hong Kong U has had, particularly in the post-1997 period, but well before that, have very, very good traditions of governance in which the council has been a supportive agent of the university. And I don't know enough about the current situation, but I know that there were enormous tensions back at the time when I was pursuing, uh, when I and uh, um, a very distinguished group uh, of colleagues were, were pursuing uh, the, the work uh, for Sir Malcolm Grant, who was also formerly the chair of the UGC, uh, was on this group. And uh, we were very optimistic that we could try to insulate the politics, not that people shouldn't have political opinions, but that it not become a political football. And there, I think, I'm not sure that we uh, yet succeeded because there was apparently a university should not be governed uh, by its governing teams. It should be governed by the, by the president, the vice chancellor, by deans, and so on. And the governing council of the university, like a board of trustees at an American university, are there to support the university, not to undermine it. And I very much hope that is now and will remain the case. Okay, thank you very much. So let's uh, open the, uh, well, Brian, you have a question. Thank you so very much, Professor Kirby. It's an absolute honor to have you here. I'm Brian, I'm the assistant professor. I think you know, your sharing and your conversation with Daniel just said fully highlights the importance of critical and balanced exchanges at times like these. My question concerns internationalization, which is that we look at the history of Chinese universities, internationalization in the 20th century, the 19th century even, and largely been about engagement with the West, with the UK, America, with Europe, and beyond. We sort of live in an era where the global south is a term of the concept has gained increasing traction, where there's talk of as not Southeast Asia being an emerging region of influence, significant influence in the Middle East, with a lot of the joint ventures and collaborative you know, universities that we see between NYU like and Abu Dhabi, for instance. I was just wondering, to what extent do you think internationalization for Chinese universities in the 21st century means going above and beyond just engagement with the West, which is so, so important, but also other corners of the world? And secondly, as a subsidiary, what role can Hong Kong uniquely play in engaging parts of the world beyond Europe and the US, which are very important? perhaps not all there is to the world when it comes to higher education and beyond. Thank you very much. That's right. I mean, the, that's, that's a great question. And I, and I, you know, 
kind of just uh, to give you a heads up, I'm uh, co-editing a book with my colleague Howard Gardner from Harvard Graduate School of Education uh, on innovation uh, in international higher education, a series of case studies precisely of the kind that you were talking about, very largely in the global south, but not exclusively in the global south. And there's an enormous amount of experimentation uh, happening all over the world. And one of the reasons why we are pursuing that volume in my view, that from the point of view of American universities, American universities are still doing very well in these global rankings, still got a lot of international graduates. But American universities became good by learning from others, from the British, from the Germans, uh, and from others uh, over, over time, but particularly from Europe. And now American universities don't look abroad for any ideas. We're becoming incredibly broken. And but we, you know, we might. You know, we don't even look to see what Yale is doing. Uh, <laughs> it's, it's a really, it's, it's remarkable how insular these successful institutions can, who have uh, what uh, the former president of Duke, uh, uh, when he left Yale, why did he leave Yale? He left Yale uh, to become president of Duke uh, because Yale, he believed, had the inertia of excellence. Things are so good, how could they possibly get better? And that's true of a lot of American universities today. So Chinese universities are actually still very edgy. They're not so self-satisfied in that regard. Uh, they, uh, of course, have students now from so many of the so-called Belt and Road countries coming. Uh, they are building campuses abroad. Um, one that started and not yet happened uh, in Budapest, uh, Fudan, that looks unlikely to happen at the moment. but. Uh, there are many others by Chinese universities. Uh, Tsinghua has a, has a project actually in Seattle. Um, 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 uh, I think uh, Fudan is a place in Laos. Uh, Laos. But I, if, I think the place to watch over the next 20 years will be South Asia. You have, in the, you have the, the money and the, and the capacity to attract talent at certain scale. Uh, you know, in Georgetown, Qatar, or in NYU Abu Dhabi, or in a number of these hybrid operations that have been very, very successful in that regard. But I think India is the place to watch going forward. If, if there's a major reform announced in 2020 of Indian higher education, which most of my friends from India do not take seriously. Uh, but I don't know. I don't know how many people took seriously the the reforms that really began in the late 1990s in Chinese universities and their massive expansion uh, in this regard. I think it, I think it's more daunting uh, in India because it's much less centralized and there are strong traditions of independence of their technical institutions and their comparatively weak and comprehensive institutions. But there is experimentation all over the world. And I personally think that unless you're engaged in this, this is what worries me about American parochialism that I just described it. You will be left behind. Um, along those lines, there's actually a new book coming out by Noah Pincus. Yes. Yeah, that, as you know, it's um, he's, I think, the provost of Duke Quinshan, right? Yes. And, and he, and he co-authored a book with nine case studies coming out by Penn State University Press of universities around the world that are innovating. And I think most of the case studies are outside China. And, See, that's right. That's right. It's a very, it's a very, I, I read it, uh, you know, in, in, before the press, or it's an excellent, excellent book. It's an original title. I forget what the final the yeah. title was, Start Up You. Mm. Uh, but it's not that. No, I don't think that's the final, but yeah. So any other uh, questions or, or comments? Criticisms are uh, yes, also. and 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 if you don't mind, if it is uh, maybe staying, uh, maybe here first, and then uh, saying a little, uh, just who you are. Or, yeah. Hi, my name is Shi Ying Tan, and um, my question is: uh, You just mentioned, Professor Kirby, that um, the university should not be governed by the university council. Oh, but I, didn't, I didn't. I didn't say that. Please, I'm please correct me. Yeah. And okay. And uh, I guess I oversimplified. My apologies. Um, but to bring this question closer to home, 
your own, that um, it seems like the American universities have now been the battleground. And uh, um, it's influenced, greatly influenced by politicians on the Hill and their great donors. And I wonder what you think of that. Yep, I'd be happy to say. First of all, it is the job of the University Council here to be the, the, the governing body of the university, but it's not to be the management body of the university. So that, that's, I, 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 I mistaken that before. It's not to, it should not be what in charge of the day-to-day -day operations. It, it needs to, it, it has to do, you know, sort of proper structure of governance. Well, what, you know, how are decisions to be made? This kind of had to look after the financial well-being of the institution and so on. And you know good governance when you see it, but you mostly know it when it's absent, uh, when, when you know it's bad governance. So Harvard had a terrible problem of university governance in the first decade of the 21st century. We had, I think we had uh, four presidents in four years. Um, it's not a, not a good thing, uh, as it turns out. Uh, so you, and that was because of the weakness of the institution of the then Harvard Corporation, weakness of it as an institution, a council of the individuals who were then running it. It's in much better shape today, I believe. Um, but it is, you know, there, it's shocking to me reading all of this stuff only from Hong Kong, the degree to which, you know, major donors can seem to have a hand in in the selection or deselection of university leaders. Uh, I have to hope and assume that the University of Pennsylvania, uh, that its governing board has more backbone, made whatever decision they made, or the president of the university made whatever decision she made, irrespective of threats from individuals, however well-intentioned these people as alumni have been, uh, or other words, you cannot sell your soul uh, to Harvard is named for John Harvard, who actually didn't pay that much. But the uh, but you cannot sell your soul to people who are, you know, they're, they're there to support the university and ideally not to undermine it and not to be involved in day-to-day -day governance. So the same issue as, as at HKU, absolutely correctly, is a is a huge issue in the United States. So UC Berkeley, that example I showed of the governor intervening in the governance of the university firing the head of the uh, of uh, the University of California system, a man who made it the greatest public uh, system of public higher education in the world because of ideological disagreements. That's precisely the kind of thing that should not happen. But what Governor DeSantis in Florida has been doing uh, that kind of orchestrating curriculum changes uh, in the state of Florida at virtually every level, but particularly in the universities or changing the governance of one of China, one of Florida's public universities virtually overnight. These are incredibly destructive uh, operations, no matter where they happen, and they're happening right now as much in the United States as anywhere else. So. Uh, so thank Professor Kirby for this uh, wonderful book, Lots of mm -hmm. Interesting Stories. Uh, I look forward to reading your book. Uh, I'm Jiang Nan. Um, from uh, the, the politics department. Uh, so my first question is about your case selection. Uh, you chose three uh, universities to study in this book, Tsinghua, Nanjing, and HKU. Yeah. Uh, so as someone graduated from Beida, uh, Peking University, <laughs> and, uh, so you know that Beida and Tsinghua we are frenemies. Uh, so I feel that I have the obligation to ask you the question of why between Tsinghua and Beida. Uh, you chose to study Tsinghua University, uh, but no, not Beida. Uh, and my second question is uh, to share an uh, anecdote. Uh, so over this weekend, we had a conference uh, in Macau, and I happened to meet uh, Yu Keping, oh. uh, Professor Yu Keping. Yeah, so he's been uh, working, teaching at Beida for several years. And uh, uh, so we talked about uh, Beida nowadays, uh, what is it like in uh, Peking University. And he mentioned one observation uh, he has. Uh, he said the students, he felt uh, a little bit disappointed. Uh, he felt the students there uh, are lacking uh, inherent eager to pursue knowledge. 
uh, and uh, this shared is nothing to blame young students or anything. Or maybe it happened there are some students, uh, exchange students from Beta in this room. But this is just an observation. So I wonder uh, uh, how much you, you share this view uh, about the young students uh, in mainland China, in Hong Kong, and also the United States. Uh, so what are the students over in Morocco like? You know, I'm also curious about the you know, US. So I, I left the US uh, in 2012. Uh, I also taught in US for several years. Uh, so I wonder how the young students are like uh, in, in the United States nowadays. Thank you. So I'm going to beta question. Anyway, of course I thought about doing it, but I didn't want to do both. It would just have to be beta and Shima. That would be an easy thing to do. Mm -hmm. And uh, at the time, I was working much more closely with Chingma than with Beida, but I know Beida very well. It's the, I think it's the first Chinese university I ever visited. I was just uh, visiting there this uh, last summer uh, with uh, the party secretary, Haoping, who's really a, one of the great educational leaders of China, a really wonderful man. When he was vice uh, minister of education, he was the one who oversaw NYU Shanghai, Du Kunshan, Schwarzman, uh, he made all of that happen, so we're a remarkable man. So I have nothing but admiration for him. Chen uh, fit a little bit more easily into the story of, uh, of moving from Germany to America to China, in part because of the founding of Tsinghua University. And, uh, and of course, of course, the Chinhua people will tell you that they're number one. Uh, what? <laughs> but you know, we all know that there are two number ones. Uh, in <laughs> seemingly always moving. Uh, there no, that's one ranking that's easy to predict. Um, but I chose Nanjing University rather than Beida because I wanted to look outside of the capital. I, I wanted to look at a place that had been, the title of that chapter is called The Burden of History. Nanjing University today is the inheritor of multiple institutions, Jingling Dashu, Huali, Zhongyang Dashu, the Nationalist University, and many other things, which had been actually the largest university in China at one point for the Sino-Japanese War. Uh, and, and of course, it had been a center of learning with the Nanjing, with the uh, Academia Sinica, and so many. So I, I, looked, I wanted to look out, to look into the provinces as it were, even at a, a very, very successful province, to look at a different institute. And I chose the University of Hong Kong because I wanted to look at the greatest research university in greater China that was not under the Chinese Communist Party yet. Um, uh, yeah, no, not under the Chinese Communist Party. So I, uh, and that's the reason uh, I did it. And, and I had, because of my time at UGC and so on, you know, an enormously amount of, of, of knowledge about this. And each one of those gave me access to their archive, which I thought was quite remarkable. Uh, and this university in particular opened in that regard. So I was very, very grateful to uh, President Mathis. Uh, for assisting that. As for students, you know, I gotta tell you, they are much more alike than they are different. Uh, if they are challenged, if they are told what the expectations are, they're given the opportunity to participate, speak. I find, you know, that some of the best students I've ever taught in lectures and so on, committed to China, or in Hong Kong, uh, sometimes in Boston. Uh, but the, uh, uh, I, I totally, you know, this idea, there are all these stereotypes. The Americans are somehow innovators and self-starters and so on. Why? I tell you, that's not true of my kind of this term. <laughs> no, that's a off the record. Um, it is true of my kind of this term. I'm just joking, but it's, but, and then the Chinese are now passive leaders. So people, these, you know, these are all young people of extraordinary talent, otherwise they would not be in these institutions. And if they are challenged and given the opportunity to participate, a lot of it is about pedagogy, not about the student's capacity, but how you engage the student. Uh, and if you allow for passive learning, students won't be have passive learning, whether it's at Harvard or at Beida uh, or at HKU. So I, I very, it's the great thing about being a professor is that you see that each generation is actually a little bit smarter than the last. Getting better uh, I'll, I guess I should speak. Um, so thank you, Mike, and Julian Feng Li. And uh, first, I'd like to thank you very much for choosing this picture that brought back a lot of memories. 
Well, you're from Nanda. From Nanda. Excellent. <laughs> Wonderful. <laughs> and incidentally, I also gone to the gone to the college in Connecticut that took uh, tax money. Away from ah, Harvard. I forget the name. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Okay. okay. Yeah. Too. <laughs> but anyway, so. Actually, since uh, you mentioned Nanjing University, I want to pick up and ask you. This is such a wonderful university that, first of all, stood up for uh, women's liberation in, in China and then stood against the Japanese in the uh, Japanese uh, Imperial Army. Yes. And during the um, Nanjing massacre. Yes. And the first established, um, the, you know, the first established the, 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 uh, the Sichuan Center with the, with the American University. Yeah, when you look back at it, actually, the, among the universities that I know, it, among the ones I've studied, it is the one that is more dedicated and rewarding of teaching than other art research universities in China. Yeah, when I look back, I, mean, I felt like a mixed feeling about this space. Because it was, as you point out, this is, the, this is the one of the three universities that dropped out from the, from the international ranking, not because it didn't. Not because the lack of, 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 of advanced science research, because uh, I guess it's political reasons. And I was wondering, what do you think the fate of this uh, Nanjing, uh, Johns Hopkins Nanjing University Center is like to be? And, and, um, and, and the, other, the other thing is, I, I think that it's increasing. I, I try to arrange some of the uh, Lectures, try to arrange some visitors to, to visit the, and give lecture at Nanjing University and become increasingly different. Yeah. One question you bet people ask me is a check the passport. Yeah. Yeah, no. So, so there is not just at Nanjing University. Um, I was mentioning earlier today that I was invited to give a talk at, at Chihuahua on the highly political topic of teaching in the case method. <laughs> to the business school there, but because there were two or three foreigners invited to this talk, got canceled because supposedly they need permission to move ahead of time to the Ministry of Education. Yes, so that, was the, that was the problem I had. And this, this is a terrible thing. And uh, if, if that kind of thing continues, um, it, it, self isolation is the death knell for any university anywhere in the world. And so if you're but Nanjing University, I found, you know, they were under enormous political pressure, like they died, uh, but perhaps with less capacity to resist this political pressure than they died. They had a, their own Marxist students who were very strong and organized group. I, I write about it in this chapter. Uh, the party secretary is retired uh, because you have a whole range of uh, university leaders Party secretary of the president who took great pride in these idealistic students and tried to protect them. And a number of them were cashiered, including at Nanjing University. And Nanjing University was forced to change its constitution to remove uh, things in its charter about freedom of expression and put in, you know, leadership of the Chinese Communist Party, et cetera, et cetera, sort of phrases that you could all imagine. And but that does not happen except under great duress. Uh, and yet this is a university, you know, I, I know uh, a number of the historians there, they're great historians. They've been fearless in their writing about the Republican period, which is a very, still a very dicey topic. Uh, more dicey now than it was 10 years ago uh, uh, in China. Uh, and I believe that the Hopkins Nanjing Center will endure. Um, I worry more about the American side uh, in in in, uh, in helping in restricting the, the Hopkins Nanjing Center than, than the Chinese side, um, but we shall see. It would be a, it would be a big loss uh, to our two countries if that were to disappear. Well, before we end, uh, one humble request for your next book: if you can do a case study of <laughs> Shandong University, Shandong University, yeah. and the beans uh, of Shandong. <laughs> <laughs> there, there's a wonderful yeah. party secretary. Uh, yeah. Sorry. Oh, okay, one more question. I'll be brief. I'm Kelly Sun from HKUSD, and unlike Zhang Nan, I won't ask you about your case selection at the Hong Kong University, even though HKUSD was founded as the first research university in Hong Kong. Instead, my question concerns the aftermath of the DOJ's uh, China Initiative on American uh, universities, uh, in particular perceptions of Chinese faculty or Chinese appearing faculty and students. And in that context, I'm just wondering to what extent Hong Kong is being considered 
Chinese as well. Great question. Uh, first of all, that initiative, uh, you're referring to the China initiative that began under the, the DOJ's China initiative. Right, which is over. I know. Right. Yeah. Uh, officially. And uh, officially, and I think actually, in fact, uh, if you look at the actions of the Biden administration, and if you look at the extraordinary production of visas that they've given the Chinese students to be in the United States, I think it's over, in fact. I think there is a worry that Hong Kong can kind of get into maybe with the bathwater type of uh, metaphor that is uh, that it gets swept into this into this uh, regard because there is a very imperfect understanding of what the situation in Hong Kong is today uh, compared to what it appears to be by some in Washington. Mind you, there have been enormous changes in Hong Kong which uh, <clears throat> make it understandable why people might worry that the institutions that they knew and thought that they knew uh, will have changed quite dramatically in this regard. But I don't see any any DOJ initiative on Hong Kong uh, in this regard. I've never I've never heard of it, uh, and it would be very. And is it really true the USC is founded as the first research university? This was founded in 1991. UGC established as the first research. Oh, I think you have to disagree. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> no, HK, HKU, don't, don't agree with that. The first president of the U.S. team was a gentleman named Wu Jiawei. Wu Wu Jiawei. He was a graduate of, when I was teaching at Washington University in St. Louis, he was a Washington grad. And he becomes the first president of an incredibly innovative man uh, building this new institution. But also, in terms of, and I don't know if this is still the case, uh, you know, when you're in, when you found a new university, you get to start all kinds of new traditions. So he designed his own presidential robe in imperial yellow. Uh, I don't know if your president still wears imperial uh, yellow. No, it's very dark. Okay. Uh, yeah. When I was dean at Shenzhen University, we, we wore red, but the the president and the chief party secretary were at war yellow. It was very envious. <laughs> so, um, well, that was, before we conclude, we have uh, our dear leader, who will make some concluding words. Well, first, I have a, a lot of thoughts. Uh, thank you. Thank you for all this really wonderful, stimulating conversation. And thank you, Bill, for uh, helping us review that the incredible history that the, the everlasting power of educational exchange for both countries, but also twist the terms, you know, in these centuries. I'm particularly struck by your candidness, your fairness, your sense of humor. But most importantly, I think you mean you really show your optimism about the future and the hope that the both countries will remain open at this very difficult time. So it's really wonderful to hear your thoughts. I have a small token of a gift <laughs> to you. I think it's a token uh, in a number of ways. In one of your photos, uh, have the lines, right? Is that the who was gift to Harvard or what? Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. In front of me, yeah, 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 yeah. And also line, it happened to be the temple of H uh, HKU. Yeah. The green is our color. This is especially made for our inauguration of the, uh, the, the, China, the contemporary, uh, uh, contemporary China and the world. And uh, this is the back, it's the C. Uh, English is the renew, uh, renewed hub and the new horizon. And the thing is, uh, I think this is the third thing, very much in mind with your good work. And I think we will try our best to be very much in mind. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.